Hi, everyone. Welcome on in. Um, I will be taking roll for all those who are with Brush Country CASA so that I can enter it into Optima for continuing education. I know we invited another uh, few programs. If you are, are able to enter that yourself into Optima, if not, I would just suggest maybe getting with your uh, CASA supervisor to get those hours in for you. Um, today, we have Karen here with us. Karen, if you want to go ahead and just say a little bit about yourself and get started. Um, we will have some questions. I'm not sure, would you prefer that we wait until the end for those questions or um, do them throughout? Whatever you want. I'm pretty I'm pretty informal as a person. Um, so I, I think that it's important that when you, I know how I, my mind works, of if I have a question, I need to learn it before I can move on to the next thing. So if, if you need to interrupt, and I think I'm pretty good about monitoring the chat. So if you don't want to physically, you know, say something, you can certainly put it in the chat and we can get to it as we get to it. So whatever right. works for you. Perfect. So we can do it as we go. And as well, I'll be keeping an eye on that chat so I can read those questions aloud and then give you an opportunity to answer that for the volunteers if they don't feel like speaking um, aloud. Perfect. So here we go. Uh, and it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know if you want to share um, something. I did have a couple slides. I don't know how you want, or I can just look at, I can look at them and tell you what they say, um, or how you would prefer to do that. All right, cool. All right, so I'm going to share that. Can you confirm? Y'all can see what it says. Yes. Your screen yes. sharing. Yay. Um, I will put it in the. Okay. So I'll leave it like that so I can keep seeing y'all because I think when I change it to full screen, then I can't see people. Maybe that's not distracting to you, but it's. Uh, so I think how this started, I did a presentation out in Huntsville. Um, to the to the casa in person there as their annual or annual training so i work for dfps i'm one of the substance use specialists so what i do is educate caseworkers judges uh, lawyers anybody who's willing to get some information about drugs um, we know that we remove um, or 67 percent of our removals are drug related so we know that this comes up often um, so this is phrased kind of what should you know, because obviously you're not the one drug testing somebody, you're not the one kind of making maybe determinations, but sometimes information shared with you that maybe you're not really sure what to do with. So that's kind of how it's phrased or how it was phrased to me of what our goals were. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of the tools first of when we collect oral fluids from somebody, um, what are we doing? What are our goals? Um, I'm more distracted by this than I thought I would be. <laughs> sorry. All right. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Y'all don't y'all don't care about what y'all can see and can't see, but it's it's driving me crazy. Uh, sorry. Um, so there we go. All right. And then we'll go back to this. Share screen. Okay. So nope, that's not. While it's recorded, of course. Okay. Um, okay. So, all right. So when you, if you've never collected oral fluids from somebody before, um, what essentially happens, um, the caseworker should never put something in someone's mouth. They should give the inf information to the person doing it, and they should conduct the drug test or the oral screen by themselves. Um, we're told to wait 10 minutes or so prior to collection. So, um, I know generally I train investigators and caseworkers um, only count the time that you're observing somebody. Don't take their word for it. Um, we also have had to add some additional, not just food, drink, um, smoked, but vape dip to our kind of spiel. Um, there's a lot of drug tests um, results or drug screen results that we get back that are kind of rejected or wonky. That's the word I'll use. Um or invalid, or they have some weird result um, because of the additional things that are like in vape pens and, and dips. Um, so generally that's something just for you to know. Um, what happens is there's an indicator window. Um, they have enough saturation, so basically enough saliva to generate a result. Um, negatives come up 
pretty fast. I don't know if that's helpful to know, but negatives are pretty easy to see. Um, if a red line appears, that means enough was collected and it was negative. If there's nothing there, that means positive. So it's almost the opposite of what we've always maybe thought of, um, particularly if you ever did a home pregnancy test or things like that. Like when you see a line, it means something. It's actually the opposite. Um, negative is a line. Nothing is something. Um, so I think that that's kind of confusing. Um, but the thing you might care about is how long it detects for. And I have this in a chart. I'm a chart person. So if you like charts, I have a chart for you. Um, but generally, we don't advise um, investigators, caseworkers to collect oral fluids unless they look high when we show up. Um, the in intake was last night. The investigation started law enforcement on the scene, um, that kind of thing. Um, it's really important that caseworkers know this because sometimes we wait too long and then we get a negative, but that doesn't generally mean the kids are safe. It might mean something different than that. Um, you should also know that oral fluid collection at the out in the world is just a screening. Um, this is a big important thing that caseworkers struggle with um, because technically they shouldn't be admissible in court. Technically, there's a lot of things that a, pa uh, a parent can be using that could cause, they use the word false positive. We call it preliminary or presumptive positives in our kind of world. Um, medications they're taking, um, they're not waiting the amount of time they were supposed to. They're, they're using uh, vape pens. That like There's a lot of reasons why it might appear positive. Um, generally what I train investigators to do, because I typically are in charge of investigator training, is if a preliminary result is positive, then they need confirmatory testing. That's typically how I recommend they phrase it. Why it's important to know is when we get to urine, it's sometimes they are lab confirmed and sometimes they're not. So if we get, um, if you, the most common intake we get from the department's point of view is mom and positive at birth at the hospital. Why it's important for you to know that those are also just screenings is there's a lot we do or not we, but the hospital does to maybe stimulate labor. There's a lot they do to manage pain that could look like a stimulant, could look like an opiate. Um, that again, technically um, we should require if I were an attorney of any child's case, any parent's case, I would require medical records to be available because we need to ensure that nothing was given to the parents that could cause this positive result. A lot of times it's impossible, but again, I, as a parent advocate, you might care of making sure that these claims are valid or not valid. Um, so there's a lot that people, there's a lot that happens. If we get meconium back, which is the poop first stool of the baby, those are lab confirmed tests. Um, so that means that essentially the baby, um, the mom digested something that the infant newborn um, also di digested and voided um, in the first stool. So that starts to be possible at 12 to 16 weeks gestation. So the reason that is, is the digestive tract doesn't exist before then. So essentially anything that the mom has ingested um, doesn't come out until then. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so that's the math that we're using whenever we determine when the use happened. Exposure doesn't make sense. Hopefully that's logical to you that anything that the mom is exposed to isn't digested by the mom and then thus digested by the infant. So that's not a reasonable explanation. Um, when we conduct, when DFPS conducts urine testing, they are lab confirmed, and this is our detection window. Generally, you don't have to memorize this chart, and I don't tell caseworkers to. Um, if they're positive on urine, it means that they've used in the last three days or so. Probably good enough to kind of, um, I tell investigators, kind of that's enough for you to maybe start your polite confrontation of like, hey, we know you've used in the last three, three days or so. Um, the big exception to that that we come to often is prescription meds, which is the last two rows, are barbiturates, benzodiazepines. Barbiturates are kind of, aren't used as often. There's a lot, there's a lot, I don't want to say better, but there are less side effects to other medication that also treat those things. So the big one is benzodiazepines. Those can stay in the system for up to six weeks. Hopefully it makes sense to you. That's one of the reasons that we tell people that they have to take um, anxiety meds specifically for like two weeks before they work. So there's a low level of metabolism that kind of remains in the person. The other big exception that causes 
our world kind of some issues is marijuana. All these drugs are water soluble, which basically means our kidneys eliminate them at a very specific rate. That's why the window is so short for elimination. I take heroin, it's gone in two days. That's the math. Um, marijuana is fat soluble, which means that it depends on the person how long marijuana stays detectable in my body. I go to my cousins, I go to my neighbors, I smoke a joint. Um, it could stay in my system for two to seven days. That's a huge um, window of time from a child safety point of view. What happens more often is the parents been using every day till we met them. They've been smoking pot for five years and now we show up and we say, hey, you need to stop using marijuana. It could be detectable for two months. Um, so sometimes in my in our world, we're closing an investigation and they're still testing positive. Because marijuana is fat soluble, what that means is if we would hope um, when we see drug test, uh, drug court clients for specifically, if they go in, let's say the literature says every Thursday, we would expect to see, you know, the level go from a thousand to 800 to 600. We start to see a decline. Marijuana might be more complicated than that. Um, as we all know, when we weigh ourselves in the morning, we weigh less. That's because more fat's been eliminated in that void of urine. It also means that urine's more concentrated. That's why generally the urine in the morning is um, is darker in color, those kind of things. So more fat is eliminated in the morning. So if I go um, as a drug testing participant, if I go in the morning, naturally marijuana will be higher in my detection level. So if I went every single Thursday at 8 a.m., that level might start to go down. But if I went this Thursday at 8 a.m. and then the next day at 3 p.m. or the next Thursday at 3 p.m., the level might go down, but then the next week I go at 8 a.m. and the level might be the same. Essentially, um, it gets complicated. This was my point. Um, but that's the detection window um, for urine. So if you've ever wondered about hair strand tests, we have moved away from hair, hair strand testing um, children. I don't know if you felt that vibe. It was a 2021 kind of initiative that the legislators really were pushing towards us. Um, one of the big reasons is that hair strand tests, this is like my soapbox, so I apologize if I go on a rant about it, but hair strand, if somebody told me that there was a safety concern because of a hair strand test, that would be an illogical statement. The reason for that is hair takes about 10, 10 to 14 days for hair to grow from the inside to the outside of our head. We don't do hair follicle testing. We don't wax people's head. So if I did all the drugs in the world today, the drugs wouldn't be detectable for 10 days from now. So that's a really important from a safety perspective point of view. Um, they're detectable for about 90 days. So if you, if some, if a caseworker emailed me right now and said, hey, I have a hair strand test, it's positive, what does it mean? What I would respond is today's the fifth. So I would subtract 10 days and I would say, it appears that the person used between 725 and 1025 then they will respond to me, but what about the levels? What do they mean? The problem with the levels is it doesn't look at individual days of use. It looks at the pattern of 90 days. So if it's positive, it doesn't say that they used a whole lot one time. It doesn't use it. They, it doesn't mean that they used every day. It doesn't mean that they used, you know, six months or uh, six weeks ago or two weeks ago. It doesn't differentiate. It just tells me a level. And so it gets really complicated. Um, with levels and hair strand test. The other thing um, is sometimes it's the only test available. Hair strand tests are all we can do on children. We can't, from the department and contracts, unless the judge orders it, we cannot do anything else. Um, this is true for perpetrators and parents if they're minors. Um, so if they're a 16 year old mom, hair strand test is all that the department per policy is allowed to do unless court ordered to do something else. Um, so that might be something for you to be aware of. And when I say 90 days and head, hair, what I'm talking about is head hair. So hair on the top of your head. So body hair. So that includes facial hair that comes up once a month, this particularly in court. Facial hair and down is body hair. And that can go back to a year. Um, so it's really important. We're looking for what we think we're looking for when we're testing that. So this uh, depiction, I guess, is just telling you how um, drugs get into the hair. So this is kind of a description of that, but also might explain why exposure in hair is more linked than urine, 
right? So kidneys process drugs and metabolites and um, they eliminate toxins essentially. Whereas hair is a passive kind of thing that lives near the blood vessels, near the sweat glands, near things that can test positive due to exposure. Um, hopefully if you have a caseworker that's debating if it's exposure or not exposure, they reach out to me or they reach out to one of the substance use specialists. There's another one as well. Um, and they can get some information about what that could be. Um, but they go back about 90 days. So we do have alcohol testing. That's something that sometimes comes up. Can we test for alcohol in the urine? It's not a breathalyzer. It's not the same. Urine takes about 80 hours or we can detect um, alcohol in urine for about 80 hours or three and a half days or so. Um, so we can tell, especially if they're in some type of like uh, abstinence only a sobriety court, we can confirm, um, confirm that. So I'm going to move on to a whole different thing. So do you have questions before we move on? Clarifications you want to make? I see the chat, but I think that was from the beginning. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the hair strand test. Okay. Um, why is it that people would want to deny or say they don't want to do that because it, they take so much hair? Do they really mm -hmm. take a lot or... So what they take, good question. Um, that's what that picture is on the other page of where they take it from. Um, so they take it hopefully for the base of the nape of the head. That's what's told to them. Sometimes it does get complicated for children because children generally have less hair in general. So I know if my kids were being drug tested and that was their first haircut, I might feel a certain way about it, right? Um, but in general, um, they do take the whole shaft, that's how it's referred to in the literature, the whole strand of hair. Um, they take it from the base nape of the head, they take the whole strand, and when it gets to the lab, it's cut down to an inch and a half. So they take about, uh, this is what's in the training that they take as collectors, a soda straw, a McDonald's soda straw of hair. That's the amount because if you don't know, McDonald's soda straws are a little larger than regular soda straws because they want you to get more Coke right away. Not this kind of Coke, but Coca-Cola. Um, they want you to get that uh, surge of sugar a little bit faster. So that's the amount of hair. Um, if you're holding a pen right now, it's probably the same circumference. So it's not maybe the amount of hair. Maybe it's the location of the hair. Um those kind of things is maybe more of what their opposition to it is. The other thing is there's a misunderstanding. I think um, when the collector takes it, he takes, you know, she or he takes the whole strand of hair. And so the assumption is, oh, well, they'll know about drug use seven years ago because that's how long my hair is. That's while they take the whole amount of hair, when it gets to the lab, they cut it down to an inch and a half. The inch and a half is how much hair you grow every 90 days on your head. That's how we get to the 90 day logic. Um, so I don't know if that was helpful again. Um, okay. Any other clarifications, I guess, before we move on? It was a great question because it comes up often. Um, so, yes, I have, oh, yep. I have a quick question. Is there, if someone's adamant and they don't want from their head, can you get it from any other areas? Yeah, so if we if we take it from the body, the rest of the body, that person would need to be informed. It costs the same to the department. So there's no cost reason to make that kind of determination. But if they tell us they haven't used drugs ever, then it doesn't matter where we get hair from, right? Ever is ever. But if we know they used drugs six months ago, that's not really fair because the body hair would be from up to a year ago. We also can do nail testing. Fingernails go back about six months. Toenails go back about a year, which we do collect. Um, but it has to be all of them, which some people do um, object to. So they have to take it from each fingernail, each toenail. Um, sometimes people spend a lot of money on their nails. Um, so some people are opposed to that they also have to have nothing on their nails. So, so no um, acrylics, no, like all those kind of things. Um, but if they say they've never used drugs, it really doesn't matter where we get it from, right? Because all of those should be negative. But if we do know that somebody, you know, has been using drugs in the last six months, it's not really fair to use a different place to get it from because we would know about that positive. That's not really fair to them. 
um, and they wouldn't collect both. This is a clarification that sometimes I have to make in court. They wouldn't collect for, some from the head, some from the, like those wouldn't, they wouldn't be combined in any way. Um, so that's a clarification sometimes I have to make at court. Um, but one or the other is selected. It's particularly on men, this comes up more obviously because more men are bald. So leg hair, you know, wherever they say we can take it from. Um, there are some times where we don't have male collectors. Um, so that's something to be aware of, like, oh, this is the only place we could get it from. Um, but from a department point of view, the cost is the same, the collector is the same, like all those things would be the same. So if that's decided at the collection site, then it would be um, in the comment section at the very bottom. Like if you've ever seen a drug test result, it'll say all the panels and at the very bottom, it'll have a comment section. If they take it from anywhere but the head, it would be in the comment section. So if they did take body hair, it would be known to everyone. It wouldn't be kind of a mystery. Um, and if we ever have concerns for chain of custody things, um, caseworkers can find that out themselves. I know sometimes that comes up as well of, um, you know, oh, well, this isn't even their hair. This isn't even their, your, like those kind of questions we can confirm, you know, the same person's been signing it every two weeks when they've gone in the same collect, like all that kind of stuff can be um, confirmed pretty easily because it's all kept in um, a website that's accessible to the caseworker, but the caseworker might not know that, um, which I can help with as well. Good question, Ashley. <clears throat> so technically we can get alcohol from hair, um, but I don't know how helpful that is to most case, you know, because most people have drank alcohol in the last 90 days. Um, so technically we can do that, but it's not often. Um, I am a one pager type person. So I, I have one pagers on everything we don't do normally. So if it's a nail test, if it's alcohol testing, if it's um, drugs we don't test for very often, like kratom, um, mushrooms, like I tend to have lots of one pagers because when you need to know stuff, you need to not know, just know the one sentence about it. You tend to need to know everything when you're trying to tell somebody about it. So if you need, if you're one of those people that likes lots of stuff, I can certainly send it to you, but some people don't want a bunch of stuff until it comes up. So whatever, whatever's helpful. Um, so a question that comes up to me, um, what do different levels mean? How long does it go back? Why is it important? This is the most impactful thing that I think judges care about is if the level's high, what does that mean? And what does high look like? The problem with a level being high is it doesn't tell us exactly what we think it might. So I already talked about marijuana, but all drugs, this is true for. So this is about uh, concentration in the, in the brain versus time that that's the bottom one, the concentration of drugs in the brain versus time after it drug administration. And then the top one is when we actually test, right? So if I inhale drugs, it goes into my brain faster. That's why I've moved from maybe snorting it to um, smoking it, right? So people move, if you if you don't know the typical pattern, um, people might take a pill, but then that doesn't that doesn't work or it doesn't last. So they start to break it up and now they're snorting it. So the snorting, it takes too long. I want to smoke it instead. So instead of smoking it, I want to inject it. I want it to last longer. So this is a very typical pattern that people fall into, especially when they get to us. By the time they get to us, they might have already explored all those other options, let's say, methods of consumption. Um, but the reason they're doing things is on purpose. They want to get the high faster and it lasts longer. Those are the two missions, right? The problem is the detection level doesn't help us determine that. It doesn't even tell us if kids are safe. It doesn't even tell us if the person got high or not. This is particularly true for people that are addicted, that they've been using for a long period of time. It's possible when they wake up and they snort um, a line of Coke, it actually doesn't get them high at all. It's possible the first time that they snort or shoot heroin, they just don't want to go through withdrawals in the morning. So that's what they're doing in the morning. It might not even address their high yet. They might be doing stuff on top of other things. This is often the case when we see people that are positive for lots of things at once. So it's possible the heroin was so pure or the potency was so much that they actually have to take meth on top of it because they went into immediate, like they were going to pass out. And so they take something on top of something so that they can get the kind of high they're looking for. It's very complicated. 
uh, but to but to say that the level determines child safety, that's just not accurate, right? And hopefully it makes sense to you. Also something I hear often is the cutoff level for positive and negative is not zero, right? So when I hear, oh, the parent, um, this is particularly true with urine, but they used four days ago. So it's possible that our cutoff said it was negative, but they also aren't at zero. Those two things might be both true. And that's a really hard thing um, that caseworkers struggle with, particularly around, this is something we're doing a lot more training about. I know I am on the front end um, prior to removals of what are we seeing that we're worried about? What are the behaviors that we're worried about? It's inattentiveness, lack of supervision. The kids are basically raising themselves. Like doing these kind of math, um, this kind of math isn't as helpful as the neighbors say that these kids are always the kids in the neighborhood that are unsupervised out at the apartment complex, right? Like, are they almost hit by a car six days out of seven? Um, so the drug detection levels aren't as impactful as we would hope they would be. Um, they can show a pattern, right? So if they start to be positive every Monday and Friday, then we can maybe use some logic there. Um, but the detection levels maybe aren't as helpful as we would hope. And people process drugs at different rates and different amounts um, in general. So I'm going to change gears entirely again. So questions before I move on. I have a question. Well, I have two. One is you're saying that that the that a person that's long term use might be at a lower level and have to take some just to mm -hmm. stay steady, for yes, lack of yes. a better word. A great word. Okay. Yep. Um. So with that in mind, the my question is, when if they've gone through detox mm -hmm. and they come out and now they're testing positive but it's either at a very low level of meth or they have now got some, uh, they don't have a prescription, but they have some prescription drugs in them. What is that happening in their body? Because for this case, let's just pretend mm -hmm. we'll call it X, this child, um, the children, but one child was um, physically assaulted by the mother when she was high. So now I'm trying to say, okay, is she better that she's getting better? Or is it possible that this is just leftovers? That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. So, how, well, the detection window is what's most important, right? So if she went to some type of rehab for 30 days, she shouldn't be positive, right? On urine at all, right? Um, the We can do... Um, segmented hair strand test, which basically if we wanted to look at the last 90 days and say, hey, we know mom was using 90 days ago. She went to rehab 60 days ago. We want to know what's happened since she got out. We do have that capacity to look at that different problem is it's three times the cost, typically court ordered only. And hair strand tests are $98 a test. So it'd be 98 times three. Not that that should deter you, not that none of that should matter to you when it's child safety, but it is a consideration, um, especially if we're trying to say something different. She might be positive on that test for 90, right? So if we're looking at the hair strand test for 90 days, it's not, again, back to fair. It's not fair to say, we knew you used 80 days ago. You could still be positive. The level should go down in theory, but maybe not. And it depends on how, I'm going to use the word good, depends on how good her drugs were back then. Um, but back to your question about detox and coming out. This is the most vulnerable time for people coming out of treatment. This is when people overdose, but particularly on heroin. Most people that overdose on heroin have no opiates in their body. So if you've ever heard that or saw that visual of the penny and the two milligrams, there's a lethal dose of fentanyl. That's for people that don't use opiates. So if I I'm a person that doesn't use any drugs and I go to a party and I take a pill and it has two milligrams of fentanyl, it will kill me. However, the people that are using fentanyl regularly, two milligrams is not doing anything to them. And that's the difference, right? So if they stop and they go to detox, they go into the hospital to give birth. This is a very common problem. They go in to give birth. Three days later, they're discharged, left to their own devices, and now we've removed their children. 
they're going to go back to heroin and it could be deadly. This is what the maternal mortality task force, if you've ever looked at what they're looking at, this is the episode of by the time we tried to reunify, there are, they passed away. Like that's the math of how that works. So the, what they were using before shouldn't be on in their system. If it's outside of the detection window, I get this question often of, particularly when CVS is involved or courts are involved of, you know, we did a drug test in July. We did a drug test in November, let's say, oh, well, this is just leftover drug use. Well, if the time frame's long enough, that shouldn't be accurate, right? So that's the math we have to do um, and reach. I mean, you can tell caseworkers that I exist. I have my information at the end. Um, it's fairly simple. Um, we also get a lot of parents that go do their own drug tests. So we can certainly look at those versus the drug test we perform of why their levels might be positive for us, negative for somebody else. So we can certainly look at that as well. That's something that we do. All, I, I do all the time. Um, so uh, relating to policy. So if you don't know, any child that's born exposed to substances is required to have a thing. It's called a plan of safe care that ensures health needs of infant, health needs of mothers, needs for treatment. So that's something that the state's required to evaluate. Is this, um, what are the health needs of the infant? What are the services that are needed to each party? Um, that's a requirement by, um, it's CARA, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. Um, as part of the CAPTA, oh goodness, Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. I'm going to try, that's, that's what I'm going to say it is. Um, there are also services that are available, not where you are. I worked in Corpus Christi from 20, 2010 to 2015. I was a caseworker. I was FBSS for three years. And then I worked at uh, the Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, the Coastal Bend. I was in charge of the PPI, the Pro Project Link, um, out in that area. Uh, I also taught a class at Texas A&M Kingsville. Um, so I'm very familiar with like some of the things that are missing, let's call it that, in the area. One of the things that's missing in your area is a women and children's residential facility where moms and babies can go together to treatment. They have two in San Antonio that are very good. They are recommended by everybody. Um, if you need more information or want to know more about them, sometimes courts are not willing to even entertain it um, because of, we'll call it a flight risk of mother. Um, there are some things that are put in place. There are policies about that, you know, um, from the from the facility point of view. There's a really, really well-known one in um, Houston. There's a really one of the best in the nation in Dallas. Um, we have more women and children's residential programs than any state. Um probably because of the size, but also just we've prioritized it. They've existed since 1999. Um, so big deal, underutilized service. If you want to know more about it, um, I could talk all day about it, uh, but they are great. Um, if it's something you want to consider um, for your family, you can certainly uh, reach out to me or I can get you in touch with somebody at that facility if you wanted to learn more for, for where you are. Um, there's also intervention services. As I mentioned, the Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, they have a Padres program. Oh, no, they have a PPI, Pregnant and Parenting Intervention Program. Um, I don't know if they, I think it's restricted technically to Nueces County, but they serve whoever shows up. Um, it's anyone that's high risk uh, for substance use is the program I used to work on. So if you have complaints or issues, I will I will talk to them about it. Um, they are great. Um, they're also people that can help with things. Like if people aren't able to pay a bill, they need to get birth certificates. They need to get car seats to be discharged from the hospital. Um, they need a pack and play prior to a visit. Like, And it's not just the mom. It can be the extra people. Like grandma would be a great placement, but she needs blank. This would be an opportunity um, that maybe you, you weren't aware of. Um, it's a great, it's a great service and they define anyone that's caring for a child as um, somebody that can receive services. So if it's dad, if it's grandma, if it's whomever, um, and that's the name of the service. Um, if you've never heard of recovery support services, this might be also something, um, these are people with lived experience, which basically means they're in recovery themselves. Um, most of the women have had some CPS involvement, so they know some of the rules, some of the things. Um, they're great to show up at FTMs, family team meetings. They're great to come to court. You know, if we want to make sure mom gets transported to court safely, I don't know if you've ever thought through, right? They're about to go through the whole case in front of mom. Everyone's going to hear it. The aunt's going to hear it. The grant, like everybody's going to hear the case. 
And now mom has to go home to an empty house again. Like if we wanted somebody safe to bring her back home, that could talk through like, do we need to go to a meeting before you go home? Do we need to process what you just heard? This might be an option. Again, this is the phone number. Um, they have adult and youth in corpus, which is not very common. So youth that are in recovery themselves. Um, so it's, I think it's 18 to 21 year olds that are actually, and they have a youth outpatient program at the council as well, but they would be a great idea or great resource if that's something that comes up for you. Um, they um, will, the way that it's worded in their contract is they will maintain a relationship with the family as long as they both agree to it. So if the family agrees, it's a great thing to close a case, um, but we might, they might still have a little bit of risk there. They might have a little bit of concern. Um, they might be somebody that can follow a family after CPS can be involved in the first place. Um, we also know that most families, eventually the aunt allows mom to come back to the house or aunt, like they start kind of after the case is resolved, this might be kind of an outside of us kind of resource that can be provided. And if there are women, they give them women. If they're men, they give them men. Um, so it's a little bit uh gender specific as well because sometimes when a whole family is seeing like a whole like a counselor sometimes the dad I think it's get, gets forgotten in some of our cases but he would have a dedicated person um, for him um, if you don't know where the, I can send this to you the coastal bend um, AA meetings NA meetings if we're going to tell people where to go there's I was impressed I'll be honest when I worked in Corpus there are hundreds of meetings a week hundreds of meetings in Alice and Kingsville and um, Corpus and um, San, well, Aransas. Like there, there, there are hundreds of meetings a week, which is not very typical, I think, for a small place like Corpus. So I don't know if that indicates how big of a problem there is or how connected the communities are. Rothstown has some really uh, active communities, but they also have a really active drug problem there. So that probably makes sense that they're um, probably makes sense, I guess. I don't know. I don't have to tell you more about it. Um, if, if from a policy point of view, if we don't have conservatorship of kids, it's very difficult to test kids uh, unless we're court ordered to do so. Um, when kids are in custody, sometimes now I'm starting to see at the three-day visit, we just ask the medical provider to do drug testing. I've seen that in lots of um, standard orders, which is interesting. Um, so that's something just for you to know, it's a lot harder in investigations. This is something in investigations we struggle with until a removal happens. Um, so blood work only goes back like eight hours. So maybe not indicative of like what's happening in the home. Um, this was something that happens not often, but I definitely get a call in the regions that I cover of if there is some type of, um, I'd say meth lab or situation where um, it's child endangerment in regards to the case, right? So uh, environmental contamination, that's the way it's worded in our policy of immediate medical needs are, are um, trump all the other things. Like they have to go to Driscoll immediately. Um, that's obviously a reason to drug test them. But I also know that we send lots of drug dealers to treatment. Um, because we don't know the difference when we look at drug tests. So if you have, I mean, you can reach out to me or ask the caseworkers to do so. Um, sometimes we get a stack of 96 pages of medical records. And I'm like, what are we supposed to do <laughs> with it? Like, how is this helpful? And also some of it's none of our business, let's be honest. Um, and so uh, if you have con concerns or questions or if that medical record is attached to the affidavit, typically that's what happens. Um, we can review them um, and get on the same page. Sometimes getting on the same page is the first step. Um, so talking about substance use, obviously things we can do, encourage parents to seek treatment. If you've never been to a treatment setting, I can certainly um, call, you know, get in touch with Cinecor if you're interested in visiting Charlie's place. We know people that try, like, if you're interested in knowing more, there's more to know. Um, the council, if you're interested in going to the council, there's ways to know more about, like, hey, when they say going to outpatient treatment, what does that mean? Like, if you wanted to know more, there's more to know. Um, if you have questions about how to people get into treatment, um, there, uh, there are things called OSARs where they can call the moment 
usually eight to five, Monday to Friday, but they can get on a list or a waiting list to get into treatment kind of the moment they ask for it. Um, men wait longer generally um, for treatment because pregnant women and women that are people that are involved with DFPS are priority, which typically are women. Um, we also, something I tell caseworkers all the time is you need to give these resources to everyone, not just the parent. So aunt needs the same resources because eventually mom's going to come around and we want that to be a safe situation. They don't need to call us every time mom shows up at the house um, or law enforcement. They can give these information um, to them. Um, so this was, I do, I have this on a one pager I can send to Jennifer, but basically some signs of substance use. If we don't know what the signs of substance use are, and we're looking at this parent, it's really important we know what those could be, right? So if we say that the parent, if the intake, if the investigation, everything we were removing because the parents are using cocaine, if we don't know what cocaine looks like, every time we see that parent, we might be missing something. Or conversely, I would say one thing that caseworkers struggle with is we tell them to stop using and then we don't expect the side effects, right? So cocaine withdrawals are terrible. Like I wouldn't wish them on anybody, um, but we should expect them. If somebody says, hey, I smoke pot because I'm real anxious, we should expect the patient parents to be anxious after they stop smoking pot. Like we should expect some of these results. Um, so I can send that um, the other thing, which I'm sure you're aware of, the ACE study, things between links between trauma and substance use. This is, I think, the last couple of things. Um, you should know that it's about, I think it's, if you have four or more ACEs, which is basically some childhood experiences that could have caused you trauma. If you have four or more, you're considered to be at risk for lots of things. Um, generally, the population in the United States has about 12%. So 12% of the population have four or more ACEs. We know because we asked them when they enter drug treatment, that's state funded at least, that 40% of people entering drug treatment have at least four or more ACEs. So that's not just double, not just triple, almost quadruple the number of worser situations when they were small children, which is why obviously you all are important. Of We want to think about the next group of people of thinking ahead of what services, what consistency, what well-being elements can we put in place? Um, so those kind of things. So um, this is just examples of what they could be. Um, but we know if you've, if you've ever worked prenatal substance exposure cases, sometimes those are very difficult, personally, professionally, all the things to see the babies. If, um, if you have questions or concerns about particular substances, there are very much Again, if you get the medical rec record, sometimes it'll say in the doctor's notes, there's a specific code for this baby had toxic exposure. Like there's a specific ICD-10 code for this baby had toxic exposure from substance use that caused this problem. Um, it's veiled and difficult and it's on page 78, <laughs> um, but it's really important that we have time to read those reports. And if you are desperate for more information, there's a really good um, technical report on what are some of the short-term, long-term effects, um, because hopefully we're educating parents about them so that they can move forward. If ECI is involved, right? Like I know sometimes it's really hard to get more help when CPS leaves. So to get them the right information as quickly as possible, if they're going to be, the kid's going to be adopted, do we need a diagnosis that could be helpful to future um, success for the kids? So um, particularly at the beginning of a child's life, it's a lot, I'm going to go with easier, but this might not be your experience, easier to get medical records when they're three weeks old than three years old. So to get those medical records as quickly as possible, file them in the court report, like recommends that those are things that we get. Um, because then we might have, you know, an alcohol exposure that can get a lot of IEP goals and future things in the, um, in, um, uh, Five, uh, there's a lot of numbers, ARD meetings and, you know, 504 services and all these kind of special ed that the child may need. So we can get those things, um, especially if the parents um, four years from now are nowhere to be found, um, which can be the case. Um, so these are, just, I'm sure you all know this too, but these are the effects when we see kids that um, have parents that are using. They stay in foster care longer. They're more likely to be in and out their unsuccessful um, reunifications multiple times. They struggle in school. They've moved from school to school. Um, 
lot, lots of secondary concerns um, that we have, I'm gonna say we, the department, have a difficult time articulating what our concerns are um, oftentimes. But I'm sure, again, these are all known to you, but sometimes caseworkers have a, especially investigators have a hard time seeing the future. They're only dealing in this crisis and safety. They're not thinking about um, all these other kind of the third time the investigators come, they're not going to tell them even more, you know, uh, but kind of learning those kind of responses. So this is what I tell. Uh, Sesame Street has a really good um, thing about this. The three C's um, about um, women in treatment or parents. I think they do parents in treatment. But this is a really if we have kids that are verbal I would say a lot of times kids, particularly girls, take a lot of ownership of the drug use. They are in charge of caring for siblings, in charge of caring for mom, making sure everybody's. These are the three C's that have been. These are evidence based three C's of teaching kids. I, di I didn't cause this problem of substance use. I can't control my parent using and I can't cure it for them. These are big three C's. Sesame Street has a really good, it's a little three minute clip. They have a couple more C's if you're a professional, but these are the ones that matter, especially from a kid's point of view, because that is some of the things they deal with. They think they cause the problem. They think they can control it. If, you know, particularly on maybe domestic violence as a result of alcohol use, there's a lot of like, oh, if I didn't make her mad, she wouldn't have drank. Um, so a lot of those things. Um, and then this is my information, I think, I left a little time for questions, um, but I saw a chat thing. So that's my information. And if you don't need me particularly, um, you just want to talk to somebody, we do have a shared mailbox. There's just two of us um, that look at it. So the majority of the time it's me. Um, so if you have questions or concerns, or if you want to make sure the caseworker knows that we exist, because you know, you know how many new caseworkers are around. Um, so getting them to as much resources as possible is really important as well. So um, I will stop sharing my screen because I think it messes with people being maybe collaborative or asking questions. Um, so if you have questions, concerns, clarifications. We do have one asking in the chat if you wouldn't mind sharing your PowerPoint with everyone. Sure. Can I send it to you, Jennifer? Is that it? Is that the best way? Okay. Yes. And Ms. Donna, if you can go ahead and put your email in the chat, I'll be sure to send it out to you. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Ms. Karen? If you can't think of them now, I exist beyond this call. Um, you can email me again, caseworkers email me all the time. I get lots of pictures of products. I get lots of pictures of like, hey, here's the list of prescription meds that the parent's taking or any of them, the reason that they're positive for blah, blah, blah. It, my, I don't see, I don't see families. So my job is just support. So if, if you, if things like that come up, it's like, this doesn't sound right. Um, sometimes I'm sure you've seen this investigators are arguing with CVS of like, oh, this is what this means. This is what this does it. Um, if, if you need, if you need help with those things, if we want to all like, hey, maybe this is a suggestion. I don't know if this is how you phrase it, but here's an idea. There's somebody that, you know, um, can help with that. Um, I guess just let me know. My, my goal is to be helpful, but I will send some information to Jennifer. And if you're somebody that likes lots of resources, boy, do I have them for you. So um, just let me know. Great. Well, thank you again, Karen, for joining us. Um, if I do receive any questions, I'll be sure to send those out and make sure that everyone here today gets the answers to that. Um, for those who are watching the recording, um, if you could please just add your um, continuing education for this class in Optima. And if you do need help, please get with me. For those who are attending today, I'll be adding that in Optima for you. So again, Karen, thank you for joining us. And if we have no further questions, everyone have a great day and we'll see you next time. Bye, thank you.